is minions though? Like what is minions? Like what it, what is minions? What are these guys? What are these guys? What is minions? Yeah, we've all seen Minions, either the 2015 movie or as background characters in the Despicable Me films, or more likely memes, toys, merchandise, etc. But what is Minions, though? The Minions movie was released before 2016, before every year was successively dubbed the worst year ever, which means it may as well have been painted on cave walls during the Neolithic era. But there's a sequel scheduled to release in 2022, so I thought now that we have some distance from their first blast of relevance and are coming up on the next flailing attempt to return to the cultural imagination, it's the perfect time to go deep on a question that's been plaguing humanity for years. What are these guys? I guarantee that if I was 10 in 2015, I would have received a Minions toy from one of my relatives. And I would have said thank you and I would have acted very grateful, but I would have done everything in my power to keep it away from the rest of my toys and made sure it made its way deep, deep into the back of my wardrobe so it couldn't contaminate the rest of my bedroom. I actually considered buying a bunch of Minions toys as set dressing for this video, but it felt kind of wasteful because like they're all just gonna end up at Salvo's anyway, but more to the point, I don't want those things in my house. I don't want to know what Amazon will recommend me based on those purchases. Minions is so interesting as a product that was clearly designed to be marketed to children but is instead most appealing to whichever one of your aunts has the most questionable opinions. That's most in terms of either quality or quantity, whichever you prefer. Minions are most often seen not in their original form, but in the form of memes. They're a character designed to be bent to the whims of whoever is in charge of them, and that usually includes anyone with MS Paint. Minion memes are a bit like Garfield comics, in that they're not usually all that funny in their original form, but they are the building blocks of much better comedy. Much like Garfield minus Garfield, Garfield but they replace him with a realistic looking cat, or my favourite, Garfield minus John, the comedy that is made out of minion memes is much funnier than any individual minion meme could be. For example, look at Minion Quotes, a game that made it into a couple of My Brother, My Brother and Me live shows. The rules are simple. Justin reads out a quote from a meme that has been shared to one of the minion meme groups he's joined, and his two brothers have to guess the cartoon character that quote goes with. If they guess right, he shares it on Facebook with zero context. Can't decide if I need a hug, an XL coffee, six shots of vodka, or two weeks of sleep. Okay. I got it. Two of those are cool. You go. <coughs> Odie. I am going to say, droopy dog. Fuck. <laughs> yeah! Everything about this is brilliant. It's performance art. Everything from the thought of Justin joining all these groups in the first place to the speed and accuracy with which Travis guesses to the danger that Justin is putting himself in. Like the actual danger is low, all he's gonna do is make a weird out of context Facebook post, but it feels like he is holding a knife over his heart and daring his brothers to push it in. As far as I can tell, the word minion comes from a 15th century French word meaning favourite, a darling one, one who is or that which is beloved. It's also possible that at one point it was a homophobic slur. Whatever the origin, the word is these days used to refer to someone who is subservient or irrelevant, basically the exact opposite of favourite. The connotation is that a minion is replaceable, plentiful, undifferentiated from those around them who serve the same function. But like, what are these guys? What is minions though? According to Wikipedia, minions are small yellow creatures shaped like pill capsules. They are depicted as being roughly one third to one half the height of humans, but were later revealed to be 1.1 meters tall. They have one or two eyes and their irises are almost always brown, except for Bob who has one green and one brown eye. Cool, so that's nothing. The minions were first introduced in Despicable Me as comic relief side characters. They first appear, if you don't count the Illumination Studios logo, when Gru assembles them to put together his latest scheme. Gru expects them to be subservient and to obey him unquestioningly, but he also does seem to care about them. He even knows all of their names. That's my Billy boy! What up, Larry? No, no races. No, I'm not going to get any uh. races. On the other hand, Gru has been asked multiple times to raise their wages, and despite apparently caring for them, he hasn't done so. Also, what are they purchasing? 
Like, what are they spending money on? They don't seem to, like, need to pay for room and board or anything. Like, you've introduced that they're being paid inadequately, but not the lifestyle that they need to support. Like, don't get me wrong, they're sentient and they're doing work, so they should be paid, but, like, do they pay taxes? Does each minion have a Swiss bank account under a pseudonym that amasses a wealth that they neither use nor pay taxes on? Or are they losing all their money back to Gru to pay for room and board? Is Gru running a company town? Every character in Despicable Me has someone who's disappointed in them. It's almost the first thing we learn about every character. Gru has his mum's expectations and the bank's dismissive attitude. The girls have Miss Hattie's constant disappointment and threats of the box of shame. So it comes as no surprise that the film's antagonist Vector is under the thumb of a controlling and disappointed father. Despicable Me is a film about learning to stop comparing yourself to others and instead find a community. But what have we learned about the minions? The minions are helpful, obedient, caring, fun-loving, kind of fuck-ups, and in a pinch they work exactly like glow sticks. We know they appear to be vegetarian, favouring fruit, but they have forward-facing eyes like predators do. And we know they have butts. We're not sure if they have genitals though. Actually, that might have been confirmed. Hold on. Despicable Me 2 suffers from a pretty common sequel problem. You see, Gru's given up his life of villainy, but they still need to make him interesting. So they make him a cop. He has some trouble getting his jelly business off the ground, and he's recruited into the anti-villain league, and there's this whole thing about going undercover in a mall because someone's stealing something very dangerous and expensive, but it's really not that important, except that Gru and the Manic Pixie Dream Cop he's teamed up with are immediately suspicious of the first non-white person they encounter. Uh, welcome. To the mall family. <gasps> also, one of the minions gets beaten up by the cop and he immediately falls in love with her, and I guess whatever floats your boat. Like, they have the in universe explanation that Gru recognizes him as a famous villain, but they encounter him after immediately dismissing two white people as suspects, and the only thing about El Macho is that he's Mexican. What do you think? If anybody in this place has the PX41 serum, it's him! My friend, I too have spent many nights trying to drown my sorrows in guacamole. You yes, but I don't really see any evidence. Evidence, of... evidence. I go with my gut. <laughs> His only character traits are he's Mexican and he's very masculine. 
After that, the plot needs more layers, so they spend some time suspecting Floyd Eaglesan, who's played by Ken Jeong, doing that accent he did in the Hangover movies. Welcome to Eagle Hair Club. It's about time you showed up, Mr. Gru. <laughs> Genuinely, the only thing that makes them suspicious at all is that they're foreign. And like, yes, Gru is foreign. His accent is like, German? Probably? Maybe Russian? But if these guys are foreign, but they're not European, so they don't get the benefit of the doubt in the same way Gru does. Oh, this sucks. Uh, hey, can I be honest? Um, I thought it would be funnier than it's turning out to be to do the rest of the video looking like this. Um, but I'm, I'm just cold. <laughs> It's it was too cold today to do this, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pack up and do the rest tomorrow. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop suffering for my art now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your understanding. How we looking? We're looking good. We're looking good. We're looking confident. We're wearing a blazer to disguise our many flaws. It turns out that Gru is correct, and El Macho is evil, and he's using some kind of serum to mutate the minions into like punk rock minions that are mindless killing machines. Uh, so Gru is vindicated in not only his distrust of a man whose only character trait is that he's Mexican, but he's also vindicated in his hypermasculine dad bullshit of trying to keep his daughter away from El Macho's son. Now this plot could have been salvaged, they could have like had a twist maybe where like El Macho is definitively dismissed as a villain and it turns out that the villain this whole time has been like one of the randos he dismissed at the start and then it could have been like, ah, your personal biases overrode your better judgment in this case and he has to learn something about like, you know, togetherness and equality and not getting out the shotgun every time her daughter is within six feet of a boy but nah. Instead the narrative focuses this like Kind of rushed romance plot. This movie's so mean. <laughs> I, like the first one was all about like looking past people's differences and getting along and stuff. And then this movie's so fucking rude. But I'm not here to talk about Gru. I'm here to talk about the minions. Not much new is learned about the minions in this movie. We get some pretty standard minion antics. There's a bit where the minions are slacking off and Gru is annoyed at that, but frankly, I sympathize with their right to chill. There's a bit where the minions incompetently put out a fire that was started by Gru being bad at using the telephone, which is a whole mood. We learn about the minions through their opposite. When El Nacho uses a serum to turn the minions evil, they are the same. They're basically the same. Sort of. <laughs> the minions are defined in opposition to the anti-minions by their ability to organize. Minions may not have much in the way of self-control or social skills, but when let off the chain, all they get up to is mischief. The inverse minions are beings of pure hunger, driven only by their desire to eat infrastructure. We don't learn much more about them because Dr. Nefaro swoops in pretty quickly with a cure. The inverse minions are shown to be completely invulnerable, but we've never really seen the regular minions get hurt all that badly, so it's less impressive than they think it is. While a regular minion can be reasoned with, a shadow minion can only be contained. It's implied that the regular minions have the ability to organize a whole ass wedding complete with questionable musical performances. Oh and that they're pretty gullible, so it's unclear why El Nacho needed to mutate the minions in a way that made them demonstrably worse. And he also mutated himself, so frankly I don't think he thought this plan through. The kind of evil yet chaotic energy that purely exists to distinguish between Gru as a reform villain and El Macho as a capital V villain. Nobody learns anything and there's a teaser for the Minions movie in the credits. So with the Minions movie, the studio had a dilemma on their hands. How do you make a full movie with what is, essentially, a comic relief offsider? How do you make a comic relief offsider into a main character without losing what made them compelling as a comic relief offsider? It's not an insurmountable problem, especially for a studio that already made two movies where the main character is a villain. Well, technically one where he's a villain and one where he's a reformed villain, Justice for El Macho. He retained a certain villain energy that was admirable. The Zeppo is an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer that makes the comedic offsider Xander its focus. It's funny, it's charming, it's a fun episode, and crucially, it is 40 minutes long and they never do it again. The Minions movie has a similar conceit. The Minions are carried from place to place, causing havoc under a loose structuring device of trying to find and please a boss. For what is barely more than a series of vignettes, it's fine. Perfectly watchable. It's many bits are funny and it culminates in a heartwarming ending. The Minions movie begins with a little montage about where the Minions came from. 
It's set to the song Happy Together, and with some helpful narration, we learn that the minions evolved from single cell organisms by attaching themselves to nature's bullies. We learn that there is nothing they want more in the world than a boss, someone to tell them what to do. From dinosaurs to cavemen to pharaohs to vampires to Napoleon, the minions incompetently lurch from one bully to another. But they very conveniently spend most of the 19th and 20th centuries in an ice cave, so there are some implications we do not have to think about. They enter the ice cave after what looks like Napoleon's failed invasion of Russia, so 1812, and then they emerge in Manhattan in 1968. So that's 156 years worth of moral event horizons that we do not have to consider them crossing. I want to know what the discussion around this was, because like... I can understand why you would want to skip the first half of the 20th century. There's a lot of shit in there that you don't want to think about, but like, ideas were bounced around is what I'm saying. <laughs> like, this feels like the best out of a, a list of bad options. Like, you, you've set up that your main dudes love bullies, but also have a nasty habit of getting those bullies killed. What I'm saying is there's a version where the minions accidentally kill Hitler. Hell, there's a version where they massively simplify World War I. Did the minions somehow assassinate Archduke Franz Ferdinand? In what way were the minions responsible for the Great Depression? Which American presidents did the minions align themselves with? For the sake of my own peace of mind, I'm gonna stop listing horrible things that happened in the 20th century. I'm not here to make a machine for pigs. I'm here to make a video essay about the minions. <laughs> it's in my scripts. I have that I say that. And then like look into the distance and be like, I could have been a pharmacist, but like, let's be real. Let's be real. I was always going to end up here. Like, <laughs> like there is no version of reality where this doesn't happen. So anyway, the plot of the Minions movie is your three main guys are off in search of a boss. The Minions find kinship when they hitchhike and get picked up by a wholesome all-American family of bank robbers. This family rules, and I wish we got to see more of them. Mistake, sugar plum? Uh, You're still learning. Later they meet Scarlet Overhill, who is a girl boss. Doesn't it feel so good to be bad? Everything she says has this like vague feminist vibe, but in a way that feminism kind of wasn't in the 60s. Like she's a she's a 90s teen movie feminist. When I started out, people said a woman could never rob a bank as well as a man. It's that like very watered down version of feminism that's all like, girls can do anything boys can do, woo! But it's spoken by a woman who couldn't have applied for a credit card under her own name. There's a lot that can be said about how feminism gets watered down into like this version of girl power that means you can like point to one woman who's doing terrific and go like, hey look, feminism's been achieved. But eventually you have to stop going on weird tangents and talk about these little guys. So she's looking for employees, the minions succeed through their incompetence, etc. Behold, the last creatures you'd expect to win the day have emerged victorious! Later we meet Scarlet's husband Herb and um, I really love their relationship. <laughs> it's got kind of a like Morticia and Gomez Adams vibe to it, like they're really into each other. Meet my husband Herb. Inventor, super genius, Fox. She says Fox, F-O-X, Fox, like the animal. Because they're villains, I assumed there'd be a betrayal at some point, but no, nah, this girl boss and her work bay are hashtag couple goals right up until the end. I love this detail that Herb loves soup. Like they steal an Andy Warhol painting just because he loves soup. Checking out my can. We stole that because finally someone expressed my love of soup in painting form. Like this dude knows what he's about. He loves his wife, he loves crime, he loves soup. Scarlet tells the minions her plan in the form of a bedtime story in which she threatens that death is the price of failure. Time and time again, we see that the world of villainy is unrelentingly cruel. Failure is not to be tolerated. This is supposed to be unique to the world of villainy, but they don't do much to show that this is different from the regular world, either the in-universe one or compared to our reality, the flesh world. <laughs> Why did I write flesh world? Why did I write that? Oh God, how do I go on? <clears throat> how many of us can relate to having a boss who doesn't give us the tools to succeed, blames us when we fail, and then takes all the credit for our successes? Running out of funds and dealing with the bank is about as close to a universal experience as it's possible to have outside of saying you too when the waiter says enjoy your meal or lying to the dentist about how often you floss. The only difference between the world of villainy and the real world 
is the aesthetic. So yeah, Scarlet's plan is to steal the crown jewels because that's gonna make her Queen of England and um, pretty sure that's not how it works. I think it's more of like a magic blood arrangement, uh, but I am also not gonna check. So there's a B plot where some yetis enter the ice cave where the minions have been hanging out and they're like, oh cool, a boss. When the minions are trying to entertain the yetis, they perform a rendition of the song Make Em Laugh from Singing in the Rain, and that's kind of a weird choice for a reason you might have to bear with me for. In Singing in the Rain, Cosmo Brown, played by Donald O'Connor, sings a song to Don Lockwood to snap him out of a fit of hopelessness. The last line of spoken dialogue before they get into the song is... <laughs> and in the words of that immortal bard, Samuel J. Snodgrass, as he was about to be led to the guillotine, as he was about to be led to the guillotine. <laughs> this is a comic bit that opens with the threat of execution. As the song goes on, Cosmo unravels, going to more and more extreme lengths to keep the audience laughing. It starts small, he's carried off by stage hands and keeps singing, but the small inconveniences escalate around him until he's not only a man at odds with the world, but with his own body. He does the kind of bad dancing and self-injury that you actually have to be an incredible dancer to do, and then the song ends with his grand finale. He does a backflip off some poorly secured planks, and then he does the same on a matte painting, but due to the comedy rule of threes, when he tries this on a wall, it crumbles and he falls straight through it. He climbs back out, clearly exhausted, fighting through the pain of his many injuries, and finishes the song only to collapse with exhaustion. Cosmo is trying to convince Don not to lose hope, the show must go on, etc. You see, the plot of Singing in the Rain surrounds a studio of silent era movie actors who are trying to adapt to sound. Gene Kelly's character Don Lockwood takes every opportunity to enter a depressive spiral, but Cosmo launches himself into perpetual action. His acts of self-injury get more and more extreme as the song goes on because he gets more and more desperate to keep the audience laughing. As long as he can keep people laughing, nobody's going to ask how he's doing because if he sits and thinks about it for even one second, he will lose it. This is a routine of a comedian doing comedy as a way of making life bearable with serious mental illness decades before Bo Burnham or Hannah Gatsby took to the stage. But Doctor, I am Donald O'Connor. <laughs> it's also him demonstrating that he understands an inescapable truth of showbiz. As long as the audience is laughing, he has a job. The song choice reveals a lot about what the minions are, significantly more than I think is intended. Leading up to this point, the minions were going through the motions, working their way through an intense collective depressive episode brought on by a century and a half of unemployment. They have a pretty sweet deal in this ice cave. A home, a community, the ability to somehow grow tropical fruit. But like many of us living under shelter and place directives during the pandemic, they are languishing in their unchanging environment. They believe that what they need as a boss is someone to tell them what to do, a leader to give them the instructions they're incapable of coming up with themselves. So when a family of yetis seek shelter in the ice cave, they're overjoyed. They do everything they can to help them, and the song they choose is one made famous in a scene of abject desperation. They're trying to demonstrate that they will put themselves in danger and work harder than their tiny bodies are capable, just to keep their boss happy. In a way, they're what employers expect of employees. Oh, of course I'm gonna bring capitalism into it. It's like my main problem right now. I'm not gonna not talk about capitalism. I'm gonna complain about capitalism until the day I die of capitalism, I assume. Please donate to my Patreon. Look, obvious caveat before you get in my comments, hashtag not all employers. Maybe you're an employer and you're terrific or you are employed by someone who's great or you have a contract that means you have things like stability and safety and all that. This analysis is not based on any stories of like specific shitty bosses, nor is it based on the complaints I may or may not have about employers past and present. This is just a very, very brief analysis of what an employee is expected to be. It's easy to find work horror stories like this Twitter user sharing a handy pamphlet his teenager was given on their first day of a retail job. In it, the employer makes clear that the employee will be mistreated, demeaned and pushed to their limit. Worse, the employer tells them that this is how the real world works. This is an employer who relies 100% on the inexperience of their high school aged employees to get away with a power trip. Concepts like hustle culture and grind and crunch encourage people to push themselves beyond their physical limitation to sacrifice weekends and nights and friendships and time with their children all so that they can have the honor of earning one living wage. The minions are what CEOs and those who simp for them think of workers, completely lost without someone to guide them. 
To live like the Minions is to throw all of our compatriots under the bus for the opportunity to work for Kingship. The Minions not only willingly, but enthusiastically sacrifice everything they have for their boss. Despicable Me 1 shows them giving Gru back the money he paid them all for the sake of his plan. Sure, they fuck up a bunch, but their dedication means that boss after boss will take them on. They are unflinchingly loyal, and they are rewarded with betrayal. I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I hate you. Scarlet betrays them after what couldn't be more than 24 hours, and they learn nothing from the experience. Look, even after everything, it is kind of hard to hate Scarlet. Like, look, she takes the time to compliment the organist. We appreciate a good organist and organist praise on this channel. Edna! You are very good. Anyway, the minions find Gru because he like outvillains Scarlet and they immediately and completely stand and that's the end of the movie. So what is minions though? What are these guys? What is minions though? There's something I've been kind of talking around. You see, we've seen the minions do normal alive creature things. We've seen them eat, we've seen them sleep, we've seen them cooperate, we've seen them make plans, build communities, we've seen them play, we've seen them dream, we've seen them want and love and fight. But we haven't seen them... Ugh. What we haven't seen, you see... Ah, oh, how do I put this? Ah, how... Mm. Oh, how do I put this? Reproduce? I don't mean how do they have sex, that's between them and their god and I will not make that mistake again. What I mean is we have no evidence that they make more of themselves. It's strongly implied that one of them fucks a fire hydrant but that's definitely an act of pure hedonism and not an attempt to reproduce. The film shows us human children without needing to show us the unprotected sex that led them to exist. What we don't see is minion children, minion babies. And this all gives way to a much more disturbing revelation. The minions don't die. Earlier when I said they evolved, their evolution only kind of maps onto real evolution. You see these like three little organisms and they just concentrate really hard and then they grow tails. They evolve like Pokemon and then at one point they were like, yeah, this is enough, let's stop here. I can't really fault them on that decision. This design seems to be working for them. At one point Herb tries to torture them, but their peculiar physiology enables their escape and they're just too fun and chaotic. So they end up hanging out. A series of contrivances means that the minions are being chased by an angry mob and they succeed in escaping by being impossible to comprehend. Kevin makes himself huge by accidentally doing everything signs tell him not to do. These are creatures of pure luck. They're successful not in spite of their inability to fit in with humanity, but because they don't do things normally. Their unusual physiology and dedication to the task at hand works hand in hand with their complete physical incompetence. They've survived this long by being absurd. And they have survived a long time. These creatures are ancient. They were here at the dawn of time. Not their species, them. This one, his name is Norbert, and he pulls the same gag when they emerge from the sea and during the credits. And it's very much the same guy, back on his bullshit after hundreds of millions of years. They, these specific minions, were here long before we were born and will be here long after we die. Are they God? No, of course not. But could they kill God? I think they could outlive God. Oh, are you gonna solve it, Gremlin? You gonna solve it? In Despicable Me 1, Gru is a villain. In Despicable Me 2, he attempts to get his jelly and jam business off the ground, but is eventually recruited into the Anti-Villain League. He's fired from this role at the start of Despicable Me 3, causing the minions to abandon him. And while this has the practical reasoning of simply being unemployed, at the end, when Gru is accepted back into the Anti-Villain League, the minions leave with his long-lost brother Drew, who is embarking on a new life as a villain. Take a second to think about this betrayal. The minions have been with Gru since he was a kid, and all it takes is like a day of hanging out with Drew and they bounce. Gru immediately welcomes the minions back after they bust out of prison. There is no animosity. <laughs> Ultimately, Gru is a cop and the minions abandon him for it. And I guess good for them? Does Gru matter to them at all? Is it just that they've been around since the dawn of time, so all bosses are temporary and they don't tend to get attached? 
Or are they simply so dedicated to their ideals that they're willing to abandon their main dude once he gets to establishment? Are the minions Antifa? Like, they're a bit too excited about hierarchies to be, like, real anarchist heroes, but, like, I think they could be convinced. Like, I don't think it would take much more than, like, an audiobook of the dispossessed. It's important to analyse why you make what you make, and not because it will help you figure out if it's valuable, or contributes to society, or will convince people to like and subscribe and donate to my Patreon, but because it helps you figure out what you value. If you're just making something for fun, awesome. If you're making something because you think it will express something important about you, or about an experience you've had, or about society in some way, then that's also awesome. Me, I have to wonder why I'm going this hard about a topic that is so... nothing. Based on what I've said, you might think that I'm about to conclude that the minions are cosmic horror, or hollow marketing, or corporate propaganda to try to make us all into a docile and compliant worker class, and to some extent they're all three. But does any of that feel right? Like, I could very easily end on that conclusion and give this video a thumbnail that's something like, Minions, worse than you think. But would that feel right? Would that feel like an honest conclusion? Or would that feel like I'm trying to make them more important than they are and justify all the work I put into this script? <laughs> I have costumes. They're not much, but they are costumes. I don't think I could convince you that the Minions are part of some insidious conspiracy, at least not any more than any other piece of media. I don't know how to reconcile the fact that the Minions are so insidious and evil and eternal and horrifying on a cosmic level, but also just completely unremarkable. The Minions movie kind of just came and went. Despicable Me 3, does anyone even remember that? I don't, and I'm using clips in this video. And despite his resemblance to another creation of Illumination Studios, The Onceler, Herb Overkill didn't become a Tumblr sexy man. Like, I searched the tag, and there's not nothing, but it's not much. And thinking about all of this has melted my brain. I saw this tweet asking what fictional character could kill Michael Myers, and I honestly think the Minions could do it. Like, they'd do it by accident. <laughs> all I know for sure is the Minions are just little dudes, unintelligible, simps for authority, presenting themselves as fun-loving and carefree, but with a barely disguised sinister intent. Their loyalty is fierce and dangerous and passionate and will be taken away with little provocation. Some people think they're cute, some people love them, some people hate them with a passion. That's all there is to know about the minions. Actually, when I put it like that, I kind of sound like Australians. Thank you all for watching all the way to the end of a very good decision I made. If you like what I do and want to support me in making better choices, like and subscribe and maybe consider donating to my Patreon like the two names on the screen right now. Everyone who donates makes my credits a little bit less funny to look at. In the comments, let me know your predictions about the next Minions movie. It's called The Rise of Gru if that helps. If you're watching this video after the movie is released, go ahead and predict something anyway. I just want to know what people think is going to happen. Render my comments indecipherable. For now, that's it from me. Stay safe and say hi to your pets for me.